Well, I am Donna Thiessen, and I am the um, scholarly communication librarian with CES Polytechnic, uh, which means many different things depending on the day. But for this week, it has meant that I'm focused on um, OER week and on finding some fabulous presenters for the week to come to talk to us about sort of OER in general. And today we're going to be focused on a particular resource and the story behind it. Um, so I, preparing for the week, I actually was scanning um, a podcast put out by eCampus Ontario called Getting Air, and uh, Monique and Christine on, on that podcast, and it, it, it was a, that was perhaps the most fun one I listened to, so I really wanted to include them in our week, and I think you're really going to enjoy the presentation today. Uh, we do have some tech support today. If you check on your participants list, uh, it's listed as Zoom support, and that is Sarah um, Slimmons. I understand she's been doing our Indigenous storytelling, and so she is an expert in, in managing all things technical related to, to these presentations. But if you have an issue, you're welcome to just chat with um, Sarah and let her know if there's something that's not quite working for you, and we'll try and get that fixed as we go forward. Um, so OER Week, Saskatchewan Polytechnic uh, has received some generous support from the province of Saskatchewan to support our OER work. And so in particular this year, they're supporting our Pressbooks platform, which is new to SAS Polytech. We just implemented that last fall. And that gives us a platform on which we can start to publish some of our open education resources. But we do want to recognize the support that we've received for many years from the government uh, for OER and for OER Week. Our Saskatchewan Polytechnic campuses are located on Treaty 4 and Treaty 6 territory and the homeland of the Métis Nation. So we respectfully recognize the Indigenous peoples of these lands as part of our ongoing commitment to good relations and, re and a reconciled future. And I would welcome everybody today to this virtual space. Um, so our presenters today are going to be talking about, it seems like it's a little bit of an arcane subject, the lymphatic system of the dog. And, and trust me, you're going to love this. And you're going to know, you may not know a lot more about the lymphatic system of the dog by the end of the presentation, but you'll want to. So uh, Monique Meyer is a veterinary radiology, radiation oncologist and professor in the Western College of Veterinary Medicine, University of Saskatchewan. Um, she completed her doctoral degree at the college, uh, followed by an oncology internship and a radiation oncology residency. And um, her research interests include lymphatic drainage, in fact, in veterinary cancer patients, new methods of radiation treatment, delivery, and occupational radiation safety. And she, she told me just before she came on today, she was working with wood checks. So you might want to make an inquiry when we have the questions later about, my goodness, what are you doing with wood checks? Because that's that seems fascinating to me as well. We also have Christine Drever Charles, who's a member of Mr. Wasis First Nation and grew up in Prince Albert. Her early career was spent teaching middle years and high school students in northern Saskatchewan. Uh, when a position opened up on teaching online um, in instructional media, she uh, she took advantage of that. And in 20, 2013, she began working at the University of Saskatchewan as an institutional designer in the distance education unit. So Christine continues to work at the university and has recently started a new position as an academic innovation specialist with the Information and Communications Technology Portfolio. She is also a PhD candidate within the College of Education in their cross-departmental PhD program, which you might also, I mean, this is a side, you might want to ask her about that because it's, it's also just a really interesting program. Um, Christine's area of interest are decolonization in distance education. So welcome, Monique and Christine, and I will let you have the floor. All right, everybody. Um, I hope you can hear me. So the title of our presentation is The Lymphatic System of the Dog, Translating and Transitioning to an Open Textbook. And so this is the work that we've done over a, a couple of years to create this open textbook. And so I'm, I'm happy to be presenting with Monique um, and I'm Christine. So open education practices at the University of Saskatchewan. So we've been doing this since about 2014. Um, and at the university, uh, we've had 
dedicated instructional design support and collaboration from the distance education unit. And so I used to work at the distance education unit. I was an instructional designer, and that's how I started working with Monique. Um, our Gwenema Center for Teaching and Learning has funds available to support the creation of open education resources and pedagogy. And those funds are um, they're designed really to encourage student assistance in open projects. So we want students learning how to create open textbooks, gaining some skills in, in open projects and, and having some items for their CVs. Um, so that's the that's the bulk of that. Um, and then our work to establish this open uh, community of practice and sharing at the university is available on our open uh, press platform. We also have a new website I wanted to mention, and I'll pop the link in the chat. That's uh, the wrong link. Just one second. So many links. There we go. Um, so this sort of lays out all of our open educational practices at, at USASC. Um, so you can take a look at that there in the chat. The next slide, Moni. Um, and so our works are stored and made available publicly on openpress.usask.ca. And I'll just grab that link too. So openpress.usask.ca. So this is the, the website, uh, the platform where our books are stored. If you want to go to the next slide, Monique. You'll be able to see some of our titles if you scroll down. So the lymphatic system of the dog is there. We have textbooks about soil and um, understanding Canadian schools and then effective personal communication. But there's many more. So you can click on the link and view the complete catalog um, if you go to the website. I'll just talk a little bit about the, the um, open textbook that we developed. So Hermann Baum was a German anatomist uh, who was uh, active in his academic career in the late 1800s, early 1900s. He wrote a book called Das Lymphgefahr System des Hundes um, and published that in 1918 as part of his research work. And he was very focused on veterinary anatomy. He was an anatomist and he was a professor at the University of Leipzig in Germany and eventually was also elected as rector or dean of the university. He uh, published a lot of work on anatomy and not just in the dog, but in many species. And 50 years after his death, a group of anatomists and other veterinarians got together and wrote a sort of a, a tribute to him. And that's where that quote is from, his constant striving sense of duty, selfless work, commitment to the discipline still serves as a role model for us. So he's a very well recognized person, even though the only place we probably will find him nowadays is in um, in the anatomy of the dog, uh, big textbook. If you look at the references for almost all the content in a lot of their anatomy uh, descriptions, especially the lymphatic chapter, it references Dr. Baum's work because most of the content in um, in the anatomy of the dog, Miller's anatomy of the dog, was actually taken from his work uh, pretty directly. And he was a he was a hard worker. I guess he was a bit of a strict uh, professor. He spent nights in his lab and expected his students to do the same, which maybe um, wouldn't be so great nowadays. But he he worked very hard on uh, his research. So this is a picture uh, that they sent me from Germany. These are the original works that he did. So they're in very old paper and bound in paper, and they're not that accessible. Um, they're all in German, and there's not really much in the way of English translation. So Miller's Anatomy of the Dog did uh, translate or paraphrase some of what he did, but they did not provide a direct translation. And it, the textbook really only captured part of his work and doesn't capture all of it. So I've been working, um, you know, for years in this field and would 
find myself going to this old German book. I would get little bits and, and pieces of it from other researchers in the field, sometimes human researchers, and try to translate from German into English. And so I really thought that would be an important contribution because we used it so much and our clinicians could use it so much and veterinarians in practice have questions and students. The only way they can access some of this information is to buy Miller's Anatomy of the Dog, which I think now runs well over 200 or even $300. So we wanted to make it more accessible. And we began our work in the spring of 2021. I did apply for an, um, a financial support to involve students and to develop this open textbook. And we got that funding. So we hired different students. Some were focused on the press books work and some were focused more on the translation. And we worked on it um, all summer and well into the fall, and we published the textbook in December of 2021. So we had the content written basically with all text followed by a set of beautiful uh, drawings that he, that Dr. Baum had gotten artists to draw based on his findings. So they were beautiful drawings, but they're very, it's very dry anatomy. It's very, um, this is how much it weighs. This is the area that this lymph node drains. This is where it goes to. And at this time, I mean, x-rays had only been discovered about 20, 25 years before Dr. Baum did this work. So they did not have CT scanning. They did not have MRI. They didn't have any type of advanced imaging. So um, it really was something that we needed to translate into current. We looked for other books in this discipline. There's not really any similar books. Um, the anti-oppressive 21st century lens, we looked at it. it, it didn't really apply to this particular um, writing because this was very dry anatomy writing. Um, so we didn't really need to address that from publishing from the early 1900s. A, a big challenge was Dr. Baum's writing style, especially for the veterinary students that were trying to translate because it was a very formal, old school way of constructing sentences. Sometimes the sentences were, you know, four or five lines long. So they really struggled with that. Um, and then because it was older content that wasn't directly relatable sometimes to the imaging that we do nowadays, that's why we added the clinical notes section. So the University of Saskatchewan, we added a big section of clinical notes about how it applies now, how these lymph nodes look on CT or other forms of imaging. And then we also wanted the readers of the textbook to know a little bit more about Dr. Baum. So we had this nice article that was written 50 years after his death that we also translated. And a bit of an introduction about why this is still important. And it is very important for both research and also for day-to-day -day practice to know what lymph nodes drain what areas so that if you have a cancer and you want to see if it's spread, if you want to stage it, you know where to look. And that's not as obvious as you might think. You know, you need to know which lymph nodes drain this tumor in order to check them. So it's very useful clinically. We also worked to include ancillary resources in the textbook. And Mary Burgess in 2017 noted that when she was consulting with faculty, one of the barriers to adoption, she wrote, that they had identified is that resources they use from traditional publishers often come with additional components. And so if open textbooks don't have them, that makes using published materials more attractive. And so we wanted to include ancillary resources. It's, it's really a criticism or a, a reason for faculty not to, not to include or not to choose them. Um, also, you know, being able to easily share and demonstrate the features of our open textbook, like we're doing today, um, with the uh, connected ancillary resources that we're going to show you and let you try out a little bit. Um, without those access paywalls and, you know, needing usernames and passwords and things like that, um, it's really an opportunity to engage more faculty in the adoption and the adaption of open textbooks. So you can see it and you can try it out and you can, you know, be inspired hopefully to think about what books you're, what what books might be useful in your practice? What books you might want to create for yourself and for your students with your students? Um, so again, like I, I talked about a couple slides ago, 
I think we, I mean, we could have done a simple translation without adding any additional resources, but um, we really wanted this to be a learning resource for students. And so we um, made additions and one of them is demonstrated over here on the right of the slide is that again there was no CT barely radiographs were being used on animals at that time so a lot of times now in modern medicine the way we assess lymph nodes is with CT so we added CT images of almost every type of lymph node um, to demonstrate it to the readers so that they could translate it into their clinical practice and combine that with the very important information that Dr. Baum had found about it that really has never been repeated and is uh, nowhere else. And there's some other resources that we added um, that we'll talk about on some additional slides. And then in terms of engagement, um, you know, in designing ancillary resources to support Dr. Baum's text, the team became active creators, making time to learn the tools to use open H5P, to use the open H5P tools themselves. So it wasn't me doing the work for them. Um, Monique and, and the students, they learned a lot. They gained so many skills. It was really great to see. My role was, I think I was more consultative and supportive and, and offering ideas. Um, and so they, they, um, I think they benefited as well in the, in the process. Um, and then I, I was looking at the, some of the work of UNESCO and in 2019, they had recommendations on open educational resources. And, and one of the things that they wanted to see was, uh, down in the middle of there, a, a broader range of innovative pedagogical options to engage both educators and learners to become more active participants. And that's exactly what we could see in, in our project. So in those educational processes and creator, as creators of content, as members of diverse, inclusive knowledge societies. So that whole process is really important. It's not only about free open textbooks. It's about the process and the engagement of um, people as creators as well. So, um... Like I said, Dr. Baum had hired a artist who drew these amazing pencil drawings of the anatomy of the dog and then drew in um, the lymphatic, the lymph nodes. Can you see my mouse? So the lymph nodes are these, these sort of uh, speckled structures, multiple ones with all the, the identification down here, and then the vessels that drain from everywhere, basically, in your body to the lymph nodes so that you know what, what, what vessels are draining your tumor and where they go. And we added this, um, this ink, this, this highlighting here was added using main, mainly Photoshop. Um, and I just saw that question pop up. I believe, yeah, he was, he did use dissections um, and wait and meticulously looked for all the lymphatic structures in um, some dogs and weighed everything and, and drew it out. Um, and so we, we did that with the with all and here's a lot of if you go to the book you'll see there's a pretty much every area of the body including a big overview of the entire body is illustrated and we added um color to all of those to highlight this for our our users and then this is actually something that we're using right now in our oncology elective and i think christine's gonna pop something in the chat so that you can try this um, I mean, I went from someone, I remember Christine telling me about H5P and I, it sounded very intimidating at the very first couple of meetings. I didn't even know what H5P stood for, but it's basically, I mean, from the point of view of somebody who's not a computer, I don't do uh, script or write things. I was able to go in and find these tools and build them by interacting in press books to do things like drag and drop. So right now the vet students are uh, going through a series of key areas. So the head, the fore and hind limb, because those are the, sort of the most common areas that they need to determine drainage of. And they are getting a couple tries to drag and drop and label the lymph nodes correctly. And then at the lab next week, they're gonna learn where those lymph nodes are and palpate them. Um, so this is a drag and drop exercise and they get a few chances to get all of them correct. And if they want, they can open the book and see the correct answer. So um, 
this is part of the, uh, the basically to complete this, they are getting a grade on. And then there's another um, exercise, a learning tool that we added that's on another slide. So I'll give you guys a minute, I think, to give that a try and see if you can get your lymph nodes correct. And it'll give you, we've set it to give you feedback where you, <laughs> good job, Donna. Um, you don't necessarily um, get told the right answer. We kind of have some options as to whether you get told the right answer or whether you get to try again and can see what you got wrong, which is what we have it set for right now. Oh, and here's the other. This is the other main learning tool that we used as far as what worked with our content. And so we have uh, flip cards or flash cards. And there's, I think, about 35, 38 of these. So the students can go in and they can sort of self-teach. And we also have this in the elective, but it's not really graded because it's it's more of a, you know, self-taught exercise so they can see actual clinical cases that they will see in practice with lymph with mass masses or cancer in very all over the body in various different parts and then the main question is usually you know which lymph node group will you check if this is your patient um, and in this case it would be the mandibular lymph nodes and then we usually have a little a few comments on why that is or extra information so they can go through these flashcards and you know what if they're out in practice and they have a lymph uh, a, a cancer on the front leg uh, they can go and look in this learning tool and find the dog that has a tumor in that area and use it to help guide them or they can there's multiple ways they can look up the book is organized first section a is all by lymph nodes, but section B is by area of the body. So they have a tumor on the knee or the inner aspect of the flank or on the top of the head. They can go to that region in the second half of the textbook and it'll tell them which lymph nodes drain, which I think is probably the one that our surgeons use the most because they're, they know where their tumor is and they want to see where it will drain to. I think everybody's had a chance to take a look at the flashcards. And so we did, um, as we were working through building the press books, we had this very large image of the entire dog. And it, it was just a little hard to fit on a screen and be able to see detail that we thought people might be interested in. And so we wanted to be able to zoom in. We wanted to be able to hover over different areas that you're interested in and zoom in. And that H5P tool did not exist in press books. So we actually had uh, some additional money and we commissioned um, an external web developer who I think he was in Germany, right, Christine, or he was somewhere. And so he built this um, image zoom, which I think Christine will also has a link for. And so you can go over that large image and you could apply this to any image you wanted if there's fine detail or any type of um, picture so that people can kind of zoom and hover and uh, see more detail while not losing sight of where it is relative to the whole body. And he presented his development of that tool in a nice uh, YouTube video. So you guys are probably looking at this right now, but you can see that we can put up an image of any size and it obviously doesn't have to be a dog's lymphatic system. It can be other detailed, you know, slides, things like that, um, radiographs. And as you hover, you can scroll in and see any area in larger detail. So one of the nice things about this uh, drawing is that it showed the direction of the lymph flow. And so in order to see those tiny uh, arrows, this tool was really useful. I had, when we published this in December, there was quite a few vets that asked me about a book. And Pressbooks does come with the ability to create a PDF automatically. And we used that after we had uploaded our book, but we found that the formatting left quite a bit to be desired. And so we um, uh, had one of the students that had sort of stayed with the project, a graduate student who was fluent in both English and German, and she worked in InDesign to create a PDF that really is a nice PDF. 
Now the downside, so I know that there's some people that just don't like to work with the online or they want a printed out version. Uh, the downside of that is that it doesn't have the advantage of the open textbook, which is continual editing and improvement. And I certainly have added to that textbook since December of 2021, probably three or four times as more uh, images came available. If we see a beautiful image that represents something that we feel is relevant to the book, it's really easy for me to go into Pressbooks and upload it. Or if there's a new paper that comes out, we'll add that in there and that information in there. So that's the downside of the PDF is it is not updated like that. Um, so I would, if possible, if you're using it as a resource, I would use the open Pressbook link. Um, but there is that PDF if, you know, if you want something available in the clinic. And then I think another really important piece of the work that we did together and, and the work of open is, is thinking about being catalysts of open. So looking more widely to the benefits of open in terms of the students and faculty designing openly and beyond just being consumers and and users of knowledge um so and i have mentioned this already but learning those new technology skills and gaining experience is perfect things to you know include on cvs as students right uh, being able to share the stories of their open projects and inspire others so not only at the university but at home and with their families and 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 really just sharing more widely within the college and, and like we're doing today. And so there's that quote on the left from Lashley in 2017, talking about um, OER, the, the OER sustainability cycle and the crucial role really of students, administrators, and definitely um, instructors being the heart of such a culture as they create and share resources, mentor one another, and work for the betterment of their peers and students with little resistance. Also important is to be considering the uh, contribution of locally published works. So locally designed and produced open textbooks created with and by our university community. It's a good thing to see and be a part of. Monique works over in Vet Med and, you know, I, I was able to work with her and, and um, spend a lot of time with her and, and that's a good thing. There's also that need to shift away from for-profit publishers and then the work of OER within our institutions, it really creates that valuable local publishing perspective with a responsive dynamic that commercially produced textbooks lack. And Monique just mentioned the, the edits that she's already added to the book, where it would take years for a publisher to reproduce another version of a book. She can do that in, you know, a couple of minutes and, and update the textbook as needed. Um, and then another quote from Arnand and Jensen in 2017, they noted the continuation of the time-worn publishing model where publishers are primarily motivated by the, motivated by the needs of financial decision makers, faculty members, and not the purchasers, so not really students. And so he, when you do the work of open and you're working with students and you get their input and, and faculty members as well, so it, it's a really neat and inclusive process. Also important is recognizing the value. So our open textbooks also illustrate the value of looking back to existing research and texts that still hold relevance today. Who would, you know, think about going back to a textbook that's over or a book that's over a hundred years old and, and thinking of it as still having relevance in, in practice today? And they do, of course. Um, I also think it's important that, um, we need to recognize that we're ensuring Dr. Baum's contributions to academia endure and remain accessible to 21st century practitioners and just opening it up to English language readers, um, you know, that and, and 21st century readers online. Um, there's so many more opportunities for people to read his book and his work. I was really impressed because I uh, asked Christine how to check um how many people were using our book and i believe this is just from over the last 30 days was this report so um it was nice to see that we have a lot of people visiting it and a lot of people reading it 
And um, we still want to, there are still a lot of people that don't know about it. We ACVR, the American College of Veterinary Radiology, highlighted it on their website. And we've done some um, information sessions locally. I've talked to local vets about it. But we do have some money left over in the grant. And we are looking at um, putting an ad into the Canadian Veterinary Journal. Not really an ad, but more of a an information um piece about it just to make it maybe reach even more people and let them share at least in Canada um so I know that people are aware of it but I think there's probably a lot of people out there that um might use it more if they knew about it and I you know I, I had several people from the U.S. contact me after it went up on ACVR asking to buy it so I don't think they really understood the concept of open access like maybe they just didn't believe it <laughs> but I would just say no it's free just go ahead and and use it so and it was really nice to, to see this and um press books has a, a favorite list of their books in 2022 and we did make the list last year and i think it was actually the um was it the ceo somebody that pretty high up in the company it was we were his pick which was really nice to see and i guess Christine tells me this is sort of the open textbook equivalent of the um, of the what was the it? New York Times, the New York Times list. Yeah. So that was yeah. really nice. And I think that's about all we have for you guys on the Oscars. <laughs> so we are very uh, happy to answer any questions about any of this. Well. Thank you so much for the presentation. That was great. Um, you guys really covered a lot of the questions that, that I would have wanted to ask you about this. Um, and I, I think it's such a great story um, and, and such an inspiring story to sort of hear everything that you put into it and, and the guidance that Christine was able to give in from her instructional design background in terms of thinking about, you know, how can this be more? How can we incorporate everything that we want into this? So I think... Sometimes when we think about OERs, we just um, think about, you know, from a, maybe just a, an instructor's perspective or a user's perspective, but you've really covered a lot of ground with this and created an amazing resource. Anyway, I'm going to open up the floor and see if anybody else has questions. And while we're doing that, I'm also just going to uh, launch a poll here and invite people to uh, over over the time that we've got for questions, just to answer the uh, the poll questions, which would help me in terms of of how this went and maybe what you would like to see in the future. But uh, anybody have any questions that they would like to pose to Monique and Christine? I do. I, I'm Hi, I'm Christine. <laughs> that was awesome. Um, I'm really excited about the the. I've used Pressbooks myself, and I love the interactive things that you showed me today. They're so cool. My question is, um, you talked a lot about the U, U of S supporting and obviously through like what the work that Christine does, you had a lot of support on this project, but I'm wondering in terms of like a credit course at the university, what were sort of the requirements to have this approved as like a course textbook or something like that? Or were there none? <laughs> there wasn't really any. Um, I think we have, as an instructor, we had the flexibility to, I mean, it's not a required textbook, I guess. Oh, it isn't. Okay. I mean, it, it's available to all the vet students as a resource. And I do require them to complete some of the uh, learning um, exercises in it. And they will be asked questions that they can find the answers to during their lab. But there was there's no there was nothing that I had to do, um, especially to be able to use it for the course. I, I had to say at the beginning to get the fund, I had to tell people what courses it would be available for, but there was no official, there's no approval to be able to use it. Okay, well. Yeah, find my unmute button there. <laughs> so I'm assuming that that the um this was probably funded through the, the same grants that we received from the uh, the government of Saskatchewan. And I think um, my understanding is that there's a bit of a movement now 
to um, not fund the creation of, of um, new resources as much as to look at adaptation of resources or just adoption of resources. Did that come up at all when you were discussing this? Was there something extra you needed to do in terms of, of identifying a project to create a resource? Because it's it is a significant investment to do that. Christine might be able to comment on that more. I mean, I applied to to the, I saw I was became aware of the funding and it seemed a really good fit for what I wanted to do with this book, um, but I applied for that through the university. So I'm not sure, Christine, if you're aware of any shift in their priorities for funding. No, I'm not. Um, I know um, there's talk of of a a little bit more collaboration between um, Sask Poly, USASC, and Regina. Um, to support the creation of open textbooks and, and OER. Um, but I'm not, I'm not quite sure if they're dedicating a, a specific focus to just adapting. Okay. The, the other question that I've got is your timeline is pretty incredible in terms of what you were able to accomplish in the time that you had. So I wonder, I'm just wondering a little bit if, if you could maybe tell us a little bit about your project management, if you sort of had like an end date in mind for this um, that you are working towards and, and how you went, went about actually um, sort of identifying those key points and, and making sure that you were on, on track to complete it. So we, as an instructional designer, we we do project management, and and so we had a, a timeline, and and we had dedicated meeting times, and and we had goals, and and the book, you know, we created it during the pandemic, and so it was busy. It was it on campus for distance education. It was extremely busy, and I think it was dedication of Monique and her students, and all of the work that they really put into it that made it advance as fast as it did. I mean, for students, right, Monique? That was that was huge. Yeah, we didn't, I don't think we all met in person until like we had this Baum barbecue at the end of the summer mm -hmm. for everybody. But we had one student who, who she was not at all, didn't know any German and she built, her job was primarily to input the, the text as it was translated into press books, which I think was your suggestion, Christine, is not to like, first translate and then build, but to kind of as you go. And there was a couple German speaking students who started translating. Again, they were really hampered by that formal language of Baum. So I ended up doing most of the translation. I'm not fluent in German, but I grew up around people that spoke it. I used a lot of online resources to help me translate it. And then we had a graduate student who had recently come from Germany, very fluent in English and German, and also had a lot of training by German anatomists in this subject. And she did the final check to ensure that we had captured the true meaning. And so she proofed everything. Then we gave it to Kaylin who built the press book. And then we had, like Christine said, regular meetings to talk about formatting and questions and learning tools and all of that. And the students contributed their thoughts on the learning tools and what would work best. And then I think I wanted to mention how hard it is to stop. Right. Because you've invested, you can see Monique's invested so much time and effort into this. And, and we're still talking about this book. And we're also talking about research that can come out of this. And we're talking about another project. And so, like, those are good things that come out of projects like this. Right. There's extension. Yeah, ultimately, I mean, it's just such an inspiring story, I think, in terms of the, the potential of OERs and, and advancing knowledge. Um, we had a discussion earlier this week where we, we there was a comparison between, we, we sometimes talk about um, promoting books and we think about it, you know, as, as um, more an advertising mechanism as opposed to this knowledge dissemination. Um, so I, I have one other question that I have, and I'm sorry, I'm, I'm maybe sort of taking other people's space here and you're welcome to jump in if you have a question, please. Um, but I'm wondering, so after you've completed this, um, so you, you, your whole presentation was kind of about what you learned from doing an OER, um, but where are you going after this? What's What, what has this inspired you or, or where has this taken you in terms of where you want to go with OERs? I'm, you know, I'm trying to fit in. I have another 
workbook that I want to do. It's really for uh, radiation oncology resident training. So it's a little bit of a smaller audience that it will impact, but it's just an area that I think I see the residents really struggle. There's not really a good resource for veterinary radiation oncology resident radiation treatment planning. So that's the area that I want to build in next. Christine and I still want to look at, um, like she said, some research on this, this particular one. And I just feel a lot more comfortable with the whole process and of course the tools. And I'm excited to work with some new tools. You know, this new project would involve a lot of calculations. So it'll be a different set of the H5P tools, but I'm excited to work and learn about those. And I know we're we were, oh, go ahead, sorry. We were also talking about looking at uh, a conference probably for the fall. See how that goes. Have you gotten any feedback from your learners like in this format? I mean, when I was in university, things like this weren't available. So I'm really interested in if students like it or do we know anything? I think the third year students say they like it. I think that the most appreciative users generally are the people using it, not just because mm -hmm. they're learning about the subject, but they're using it because they need to know it to treat their patients. In practice. So, mm -hmm. You know, I, I had a surgery resident just go on in rounds about how she loves it and uses it for every patient. So that I think those are the people that are really uh, appreciating it. Uh, I've had a few people email me and just tell me they thought it was great. Um, the students all, they, they certainly do like it, but again, they're, they're pretty overwhelmed with everything right now. So I think they're using it as they need to, to learn the course. And then they probably, when it'll really come back to them is when they see their first dog with a mast cell tumor or whatever patient they're seeing, right? And they'll pull it up and use it. I just wanted to pose that same question that I that I'd asked last time to you, Christine. So, wh where is this taking you now, in in terms of your trajectory? What do you What do you see in in terms of opening up for you in terms of open education resources and what you'd like to do? So, I think hopefully support Monique with her workbook project and and the research that we're intending to do. Um, so my job has changed. So I'm not an instructional designer anymore. So I moved to ICT and I have a new focus, but open education is still a part of that. And so um, just looking at how I can be a part of that provincial um, Pressbooks instance that's going to be created, if, if it is going to be created and, and participating in some of those larger discussions and, and hopefully encouraging people still to create their own books or adapt their own books and to continue that work of OER. So I'm going to just raise the question one more time. If anybody has any burning questions that you want to pose to Monique and to Christine, um, we know they're, they're available. They're, they're in Saskatoon. And so, but, but this is your chance to ask a question. If you have something that you that, um, you'd really like to ask, but I know we have some people here that are looking at developing some OERs and some people that have developed some OERs. Um, so if you have a question, I'll, I'll shut up for a minute. If not, I wanted to uh, thank people for completing the poll. I really appreciate you taking the time to to provide me with those responses for this. That certainly helps in terms of planning future events and sort of making sure that, that we're, we're doing things that are relevant and of interest. Um, there will be a recording of each of the presentations this week. Um, so watch for that. That'll go on to the, uh, the open resources page. And maybe I can just throw that up onto the... Um, the chat there. So if anyone's interested, you can take a look at this. And this is the SAS Polytech, <laughs> not the University of Saskatchewan um, page. So you can take a look. That's where we'll get announcements or anything new that's coming up in terms of open education resources. Um, I have nothing else to announce for this week. This was the final presentation and what a way to end. This was absolutely fantastic. Um, the, on Monday, I will mention that we do have an OER Express. So this is the monthly um, update on open education resources at SAS Polytech. And our focus for Monday is going to be on the Karen feeding. 
of OERs or how to maintain them and how to use them. So it's just going to be a really interesting topic. Donna says to herself as she thinks about, I'm not sure what I'm going to talk about, but I have to do that this afternoon. So it should be great. <laughs> and thank you so much for everybody that's attended these sessions this week. It's I think we've had some really fantastic presentations. And like I say, I think for me, this was definitely the highlight. Um, just in terms of providing so much information on the development and providing such a great story um, and having such a fabulous resource. Um, so thank you so much, Christine and Monique. And, and if there's any other questions, we still have a few minutes. If you still want to jump in or you want to wait till everyone else leaves and ask your, your question, but thanks so much. And I'll release everybody. Um, thanks for coming. <laughs>